It's Wednesday night, and we are studying through the Old Testament. We've come to a a stopping, not a stopping place, but to a place where we're branching off into various subjects, and I will do this from time to time. I've come to the word signs in the 31st chapter of Exodus. We've worked our way through Genesis. It took us about two and a half years to go through Genesis. If you watch the series on Genesis, you will learn a lot that you didn't know about it. We do all the characters. The Bible is a timeline of a family. It's just a family is all it is. It's simply fathers and their grandchildren. That's all the Old Testament it is. Starts with the father of the human race, Adam. Goes to his son, Seth. Goes to his son, Enosh. And to his son, uh, Mahalalel. Mahalalel. And then his son, it goes on down to all of these sons, Canaan. And it goes on down to Jared and to Noah and, uh, not Noah, Jared and Enoch, Enoch, and then Methuselah and Lamech and Noah. Lamech and Noah, and these are all father, son, grandson, great-grandson, great-great-grandson, great-great-great-grandson, great-great-great-great-grandson, and so forth till you get to Arphaxed, to Shem, Noah's son, or Faxed, his son, all the way down to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jacob becomes the nation of Israel. His name is changed to Israel in Genesis, the 32nd chapter. The Bible is simply about this family of Adams. That's all it's about. And it's about all the judgments that God said he would bring upon Israel. God takes this nation of Israel. Jacob has 12 sons. They became the nation and he gives this nation the land of Israel. The land. Now, if you believe in Islam and you take the Koran, it says that the promise was given to Ishmael, not Jacob. Well, we don't believe that. You, these guys, TBN one year, brought out a combination Bible-Islam book. They called the Islam a holy book. Well, how could Islam be a holy book when it cancels out Jacob and his sons and gives the promise from Isaac to Ishmael? How in the world can that be a holy book? Well, it's not, not by what we believe. And they say that the land was given to Ishmael and the descendants of Ishmael and Esau are the Arab nations, the Arab and the Iranians and, the, and all of these nations over the Afghanistanians. They say all of this land belongs to these descendants and that's why they're fighting over there. It's kind of simple when you get, really get down to it. So this is the, it depends on what you believe. This is about a family. And all through the Old Testament, God says, I'm going to give my family signs. I'm going to give them signs to prove who I am and that point to me. Now, we've talked about the word sign in the Old Testament is the word oath, U-W-T-H. Sometimes they pronounce, spell it O-W-T-H or O-W-T. They have variations of spelling of it. And this word oath has been translated into the word sign, sign, or it's been translated into the word mark. When God says, I will put a mark up on Cain so that uh, the people won't kill him, the animals won't kill him, and we don't know exactly what the mark was. And all through the Old Testament, God says these signs or these oaths, they're going to be equivalent to the New Testament word Simeon. Simeon, it means to signify, 
And when you look at both these words, when you look at both these words, it'll have the exact same definition. Signify, if you notice in signify, you have the word sign. Our signature, signature is a sign of a man. It's where he signs. When somebody says, would you sign this document? Put your signature or your sign on it. Uh, and that signature, when I write this on a, a piece of uh, contract, that is a sig that's my signature, and it points to me. And you cannot duplicate somebody's signature. You have the best uh, uh, counterfeit artist that will try to duplicate signatures, but you cannot duplicate another man's signature. You can be the best in the world, but you cannot get it exactly right. These signature analysts know exactly. They know the places and the points. They say, you didn't put this on this little curl on the end of this. Uh, you didn't put, uh, I don't ever get uh, WN. I just get B-R-O-W, and I went like that. And that's, I figure if you can't read it, that's your problem. <laughs> When somebody's reading my signature. Uh, I got the attitude of some of these pharmacists, I guess. But anyway, a signature points to a particular person. And this means a, means a beacon. A beacon points out something. It points to something. I keep saying, uh, when you have a beacon on a lighthouse, it points to the rocks down under it. It says, ship, don't come close to me. You'll run on these rocks. And uh, it gives signals. And it's a flag. When you see flags, when we're riding down the road and we see some guy there with the red flags, that means slow down. If you see a, a school bus in front of you and the red light's gone, you better stop and don't you try to go around it. You will get a ticket a mile long for that. You do not do that. A red, a flag, if you see a stop sign, you don't say, huh, I wonder what that means. Let's just keep going. Uh, you don't, when you see a, all of these are simians. When you see a, uh, when, you, when you see a warning sign of any kind, that's a, that's a simian. Or you see a signal. Uh, we look for signs. Uh, we look for a tire company, and I'm always looking for something that says Goodyear, or it'll say, it'll say Firestone. I say, oh, there's a, there's a tire place. Uh, that doesn't mean that sign is a Firestone. It means there's some Firestone tires in this building down here. That's what it means. That is a Simeon. Now, I've been going through these Simeons. Israel was given signs. They were given ten signs. When they were coming out of Egypt, they were given ten, Pharaoh was given ten signs to prove who the God of the Bible was. And he was given these uh, uh, darkness and flies and uh, death of the firstborn, and the list goes on and on. They were given signs as they came out of Egypt. They got more signs. They got... Uh, uh, the sign of the Red Sea opening up. What this did, the Red Sea opening up, wasn't, wasn't for the, the sea and the children of Israel passing through it. The Red Sea opening up was pointing to God doing it. It was, it was saying, this is of God and these are God's people. When a miracle happens, which we don't have the miracles today, but when one happened, this was saying, get out of the way. This is their God. Even the enemies of Israel would say their God fights for them. And they would recognize that. What amazed me, they would say, Israel's God's fight for them, uh, but we're still going to go after our sun and tree gods, even though their God fights for them is beating us up real bad. Now, I don't even understand them saying that and doing that, but they did. Now, we've been talking about signs. When they got into the wilderness, some of the main signs was, was they got a cloud by day and God lived in the cloud and they got a fire by night and he would come and sit down in that cloud and sit on the Ark of the Covenant. 
That was a sign that was God was there. And th- that would terrify me if I knew that God was out in front of my house. Uh, but that was proof that God was there and he's going to protect them. And then they had other signs. As they lived in the wilderness for 40 years, their clothes and their shoes never wore out and their feet never swelled up and it was 120 and 30 degrees out there in the desert. And their feet never swelled up and blistered. Well, that's a sign, isn't it? That's an unbelievable sign. And the Red Sea opened up and killed Pharaoh's armies there in the 14th chapter of Exodus. Uh, There was manna on the ground in the morning. Enough manna was there for two and a half, three million people. Now, you know how many people that is. That's all of Nashville and all of the suburbs around Nashville, Lebanon, uh, out in, I was looking for something here. It was Lebanon. It was uh, like out in Fairview, uh, Murfreesboro, Gallatin. It would be multiplying all of that twice. That's how many people have fallen Moses into a wilderness where there was no water and no food. That took a lot of faith, didn't it? And it took a lot of food and a lot of water. Well, they had water out of a rock in the 20th chapter of Numbers. And they had all these plagues in Egypt. We've been talking about signs. I'm going to read some more to you out of Kittle's New Testament Dictionary of Greek Words. In Kittle's New Testament Dictionary... Let me tell you, see how many pages they had. On the word Simeon. Simeon, which is the word sign, it's also sometimes the word miracle. The word Simeon is translated miracle or sign. Many times it's translated miracle. But the signs were not for the sake of the people being healed. The signs were not for the fact it wasn't to show the miraculous ability that Jesus could walk on water. It was to point to who God was that God could actually overcome all the laws of physics and violate that. When you say laws of physics, what do you mean? I'm talking about the fact that Jesus could walk on water and he didn't sink. I'm talking about he could he could stop the wind from blowing by going shh. Now that there was more important something more important to that than just the fact that he caused the wind to quit or that he would change water to wine or that he would perform one of his miracles by hitting someone. Every one of those miracles, according to Mr. Kittle, was to point to who God was. And I read some out of Kittle's. But I'm going to read a a few more things out of Mr. Kittle's. It's a ten-volume set on New Testament Greek words and a very good set of books. And it speaks of the object of sense of perception. Now, the idea of a sign that Jesus would perform and that God would perform was the perception in the person that was watching. It wasn't for the sake of the people being healed. It was for the sake of the eye of the viewer so they would know who God was, that he was violating all these laws of nature. Now, it says that from a whole series of sayings which contain oath, which is, they use this word oath, which is the Hebrew word in the Greek dictionary of New Testament words. What is denoted thereby can be perceived with the senses. He's talking about the perception of the one looking was what it was for. It wasn't for the one who the act was being done unto. It was for it was so that one looking could say, only God could do this. And it says, as a rule, the reference is to visual perception. 
In other words, the miracles were for the man, for the viewer, not the one that it was happening to. Now, let me read a couple of more things out of this. A means of confirmation. That's what a simeon was. It was to confirm something. Without exception, these all make it plain that oath or simeon contains powers which affect the spiritual center of the one confronted by it. The one that's confronted by it is the one that's watching and it's going to affect his spiritual center if he's elect of God. If he's elect, he'll see it's God that's doing it. Sometimes we'll say, well, why don't the world believe these things? Look at all the proof that we have in the Scripture. People are not going to listen and watch long enough to prove anything because they're proud of what their mother, their father, their preacher said to them. Men's pride is what keeps them from seeing the signs of God, which work for clarification so that it is certainly, its certainty is established, which was not present before. God's certainty is established, which wasn't present to the minds of the people until he comes and performs something. I believe the miracle that really is performed in man is when God takes a man's life and turns it upside down and pulls him out of his heathenism and causes him to start bowing to God. That's really the proof of God. God signs and wonders. When the old, this is another segment of Kittles. When the Old Testament seeks of God's signs and wonders, its style takes on what is almost a hymnal character. This is connected with the fact that when the phrase is used, the re reference is almost always to the leading of the people out of Egypt by Moses. That is where the signs were prominent, is what he's saying. And to the special circumstances under which the people stood up to the passage of the Red Sea, these were people who were helpless in themselves. They had been in bondage for 400 years. They didn't have an army. And it was about the miracles that God was performing to get them out of their bondage. So if we're in bondage in the New Testament, these are going to have to be spiritual miracles. They'll have to be spiritual miracles as opposed to these literal ones over here. Now, and in all which God proved himself to be the Almighty, all this was to show that God was the Almighty and showed Israel to be his chosen people. What he was doing with signs, he was performing in these for his chosen people and he's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world and God over a period of time in our lives works miracles for our lives it is a miracle that I'm standing here in front of you after I've been through the things I've been through in my life story is like some panoramic movie I worked with stars I've had all these aspirations to be on top of the world I've done a lot of things that's crazy and the fact that I'm here teaching out of the Greek Testament is a miracle. And God performs these miracles in His time in your life. I told a lady this afternoon, she said, I'm so depressed, I don't know how to live, I don't know what to do. I said, everything comes to pass in God's time. It doesn't come to stay. He speaks of symbolical prophetic actions concerning Simeon or signs. Actions claiming to be signs occupy a not inconsiderable place in the prophets. He's saying the prophets, they perform signs because they didn't have a printed word of God. What they did, the prophet was the mouth of God upon the earth. So when he'd bring fire from heaven, they'd say, oh, this is definitely God's prophet. Or when Elijah or Elisha would lie down upon these young men and breathe life into him and resurrect him from the dead, they'd say, this man comes from God. <clears throat> Typical of their form as presented in tradition is that they take place by a divine injunction which demands obedience. When God says, I'm performing these things in front of you, Israel, you have to obey me. You're mine. You belong to me. 
So they're only performed for the people of God. In the New Testament, you will not find God healing some vessel of wrath so he could go out in the world and continue to sin. You're not going to find that anywhere. He speaks of men having faith to be healed, to be delivered, but he's not talking about the faith delivering them. He's talking about I only heal people who have faith, but I don't heal everybody that has faith. The people I pick out to point out who I am are people who are mine, and they have faith in me, and I just pick one of them out to heal them. I don't heal the devil's children. And they are combined with an interpretation. It is significant for their interpretation that eyewitnesses are almost always mentioned or tacitly assumed. Eyewitnesses are always there. God didn't perform his miracles out in the desert when nobody's watching. He does it for the eye of the believer to prove who he is. That's what it's for. And the reason I'm emphasizing this, among the Pentecostals and Charismatics, they think all they have to do is around and go around commanding God to heal somebody and they're healed. Don't you ever believe any of that Pentecostal Charismatic doctrine. It's absolutely not true. Every miracle that Jesus did was to verify Jesus according to Acts 2.22. It was to place Christ before the eyes of the people to prove who he was. But he only proved who he was to the, to the elect. The rest of them would not believe. It was simply God's verification of himself to all of his predestinated elect family. That's all it was for. Now let me read a couple of more of these. Simeon which is itself very formal in meaning, which aims at sense impressions with a view to imparting insight or knowledge. And that knowledge is that God is involved in this and you're one of the believers. These people say they're out here healing people and they're not even believers. That's what's outrageous. They don't believe in predestination. They don't believe in... Christmas is pagan. They don't believe in a daily cross, death to self, but they believe Jesus is healing them. And the Pentecostals say, well, this works not only for, for Pentecostals, but this works for evil men in the world that they can, they can empower, you can empower yourself to be healed by being positive about it. Well, the Bible says God does not work on unbelievers. It's not true. I have a great resentment towards Pentecostalism. I was a gospel singer for years, and gospel singing is supported, about 85 to 90 percent of all gospel singers are supported by faith healing, tongue speaking, Pentecostalism. I went in and out of those churches, and I knew all that so-called healing that I supposedly was seeing was not happening. It wasn't true. I've, Oral Roberts was the first big national faith healer in America. In the, early, in the early 50s, he was on TV all the time, whacking people in the head and healing them, and nobody was being healed. And he probably propagated this more than any other preacher in America. And all of the charismatic Pentecostals are sons of Oral Roberts, from Kenneth Copeland to Creflo Dollar. Now, Kenneth Copeland is kind of heir apparent to this throne since Oral died, and Kenneth Hagin died. Kenneth Hagin brought this to America. It was a Far Eastern thing uh, of, they say that uh, Kenneth Hagin started the positive confession movement. You say it with your mouth and you get what you say. Uh, he said that everybody had positive and negative vibrations in their mouth and that what you said positive would come about if you said it. Well, that's a lie. God has ordained everything to be. Well, Kenneth Hagin picked this up from a man named E.W. Kenyon. E.W. Kenyon brought this doctrine of positive confession, saying it with your mouth, from the Far East, from India particularly, where you go into a guru and they will say they have positive and negative vibrations throughout their society. 
they have actually these gurus where you go in and lay down on your stomach and they'll put all of these these crystals on your back and lay them out in a certain order. And they say these crystals have healing power because they have vibrations in them. They've got positive vibrations and they will actually heal you. That's a bunch of hogwash. E.W. Kenyon brought that back to America. It bled into... He, uh, it, Kenneth Hagin picked it up. It was a pagan doctrine, picked it up, and they took certain things in the Bible and twisted it and then they started selling people on the fact that these miracles are happening. That's why I'm bringing out these signs or these miracles. It's not what they say. And they would usually use verses like Mark 11 and 23 where the Bible says, if you'll say to this mountain, if you'll say. See, they say, Okay, the miracle is in the tongue, in the word say. If you'll say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and not doubt in your heart, you'll have whatsoever you saith. And they say, see, there's positive vibrations in your tongue. The only problem is, they don't know what a mountain is. They don't know what the word say means. They don't know what the word doubt means. I was talking to Tom this afternoon. I said, these preachers that never define any words and they come up and they say all these things, that's just not true. It's because they go, go into detail of Scripture. When you get in that 23rd verse, you have to back up previously in the chapter where Jesus comes to Bethphage. Now, Bethphage, we get the word Bethpage from that. Bethphage. This is why I'm preaching on signs more than any other reason. I've been in those Pentecostal churches as a gospel singer. And they say, if you're positive, you can have whatever you say. Bethphage means house. Beth means house. Bethsheba means house of Sheba. Bethlehem means house of bread. Beth means he house of figs. House of figs. Now, Bethphage had hundreds and hundreds of fig trees there. And Jesus walks up and he sees. Now, this is the whole context of, if you'll say, to this mountain. Jesus sees the fig tree afar off. But you have to study fig trees. Now, how are you going to do that? You take your F volume and look up fruit tree in McClinic and Strong. Look up fruit tree and read the article. It will tell you that in the Middle East you had, you had fig trees and when the leaves were on the tree, that was called leaf season. And before leaf season hit, now, I've got some fig trees in my backyard, and I'm familiar with fig trees, and they bear a lot of figs. That leaf season came. When it came, before leaf season came, you had pre-season figs. Now, you have to understand that. And this is why I'm talking about signs as much as anything else. It's because Pentecostalism has lied to the American public. You had preseason figs. Jesus is over here looking at this tree afar off, and he sees a tree having leaves. Now, is Jesus so stupid being God in the flesh that he doesn't know when fig season is here? Is he so ignorant he doesn't know anything about preseason figs? He knows everything about everything, doesn't he? So he sees the tree with leaves. Well, he goes over there. Perhaps he will find some figs on it. Well, then what is he looking for for figs? He's looking for preseason figs, isn't he? He has to be. 
When he gets there, he sees a tree with leaves with no figs. And then there's a statement in that verse. In fact, if you want to look at it, look at Mark, the 11th chapter. I preached this on Sunday night on the doctrine of the devil, but it's this is one of the major doctrines of the Pentecostals and Charismatics, Mark 11. This is something you'll hear in their churches all the time, and they'll say, if you'll say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. And then they'll say, if you have a mountain of debt in your life, if you have a mountain of uh, sickness in your life, you say, be removed and cast into the sea. Idiots. That's all i got to say to you. You're stupid. You don't, you say, Jim, what if they don't know any better? Don't teach something that you don't know. If you don't know algebra, I don't want to take a course from you. Do you? You never had English before in your life. You don't know what a verb is or a noun is. And you're going to stand and teach an English course? Get out of the, get off the platform. If you don't know anything about fig trees, don't expect to teach this chapter. And then you, you look here and he says, and this is why I'm talking about the miracles, the signs. They weren't for the person that it was being done to. They were for the person that's watching that was a believer. That was the purpose of it, to show this is God transgressing the laws of nature. Well, that's not what this is talking about here, transgressing the law of nature. Man can't transgress the law of nature by saying, disease be removed and be cast in the sea. They don't even know what the sea is, do they? Well, on, in verse 12 of chapter 3, uh, chapter 11, verse 12, And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves. Boy, when you see having leaves... A man in the first century, that would go, doo -doo 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 the signal would go up. Leaves. Leaf season. There has to be pre-season figs there. He would know that. And you can get that out of the fruit section of your McClinic and Strong. It's not like I'm brilliant. All I do is read books that will tell me about it. You know what I think brilliant is? Be willing, to, be willing to read and learn. That's all it is. And seeing a fig tree having leaves, he came if perhaps he might find anything thereon. He's coming to find some preseason figs, isn't he? They were very sweet, some of the writers say. So he wants them real sweet preseason figs. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves oops and then the statement for the time of figs was not yet now that sure does sound like the time for the tree to be bearing figs wasn't here that's what it sounds like doesn't it now why would jesus is jesus stupid time of figs is jesus afar off looking over here now he's going to try to find some figs on this tree and he's so stupid he doesn't know that there's it's not time for the trees to bear figs is he that dumb being god in the flesh you understand what i'm saying is he so stupid that he doesn't know that the time for the fig tree to bear figs is not yet do you think jesus didn't know when the fig season was why was he coming over there to find some figs on the tree correct Right. Time of figs, even in the text of Scripture, can't mean the time for the tree to bear figs. Can't mean that. Time of figs, according to the McClinic and Strong, was the fig harvest. The time to harvest the figs was not yet. So Jesus goes up there and says, The figs haven't been harvested. Leaves are here, should be pre-season figs at least, and during the leaf season, 
the fig harvest would come. So Jesus evidently knew there should have been some seasonal figs or some preseason figs on the tree. Right? And then here's what Jesus does. This is why I'm talking about these signs. Because in the Pentecostal churches, those people are so corrupt, they are so ignorant. You find all your answers in the Old Testament. Then the Bible says, And Jesus answered and said unto the fig tree. He talks to the fig tree. You can't talk to a fig tree. Try it. No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it, and they got bent out of shape. Why? Well, because it was against Jewish law to kill fruit trees. Period. Unless. <laughs> well, let's go back over there and look at Deuteronomy 20. Deuteronomy 20. Now, this is what the apostles are thinking of when he killed a fruit tree. They're thinking of Deuteronomy 20. And if you don't study Deuteronomy 20, the last two verses of this chapter, you're going to have any idea what Jesus is saying when he says, If you'll say to this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea. You don't have any idea what he's talking about. And why the apostles get mad at it for killing a fruit tree. All right. He says here in verse 19 of Deuteronomy 20, Israel, talking to you, right before you cross the river, when thou shalt besiege a city a long time, and you're making war against this city, thou shalt not destroy the trees of that city, even if they're trees of the enemy. You can't destroy the trees thereof by forcing an axe against them. And then he's, he's not talking about any tree. He's not talking about some tree that doesn't bear fruit. The next sentence says so. For thou mayest eat of these trees. And thou shalt not cut them down. For the tree of the field is man's life. They said a fruit tree was the very essence of life in Israel. To employ them in the siege. Do not cut down a fruit tree and make a battering ram out of it or make a bulk ward out of it for any reason. It's against my law to kill fruit trees anywhere. It's bearing fruit. Only the trees which thou knowest that they be not trees for food. Meat means food. Thou shalt destroy and cut them down, but no fruit trees. That's against my law. And thou shalt build bulk warts against the city that maketh war with it. A bulk wart is a, it's like a defense. You've seen this in pictures. They'll show here's the city here. And they'll have these, all these pointed sticks. Well, they actually have them pointed this way against the enemy so they can't come in on them. And they'll use them to build ladders to come up the side. Or they'll use them to, a bulk wart was a, maybe a battery, a large oversized battering ram. And they would, you can use the trees that are not for food. But don't you dare go in around killing any fruit trees. And Jesus kills a fruit tree in that 11th chapter of Mark. What's he doing? Well, they're thinking of the 20th chapter, and they're not thinking of the 19th chapter of Leviticus. Now, you go to Leviticus 19. You see... If you don't know anything about the Old Testament, you're wasting your time reading the New. You have to find out what the Old Testament's about. So here in the 19th chapter, verse 23, this is about fruit trees. Hmm. 
When you shall come into the land and shall have planted all manner of trees for food, fruit trees, fig trees, olive trees. An olive tree is a fruit tree. Did you know that? Uh, my biology teacher, Mr. Silverberg, says all fruit trees have a ripened ovary. They have a seed in them. So if you've got a seed in it, it's a fruit tree. That's why tomatoes are fruit. Now, I'm not suggesting you put tomatoes in fruit salad. It's not going to taste too good. Tomatoes are fruit. It's not a vegetable. You know that, don't you? You do now. <laughs> That's what Mr. Silverberg taught me in the 10th grade, 1954. Then shall you count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised. Three years shall it be uncircumcised unto you. It shall not be eaten of. But in the fourth year, all the fruit thereof shall be holy to praise the Lord withal. And in the fifth year shall ye eat of the fruit thereof, that it may yield unto you the increase thereof. I am the Lord your God. And if it's not bearing fruit by that fifth year and it's barren, the Bible says lay the axe to the root of the tree and cut it down. Yeah, you can't. You have to. It's uncircumcised. They would have to pick the buds off. Uncircumcised meant they had to pick the buds off of the tree as it was bearing. Now, why did they do that? To circumcise it? No, to give it back to the Lord. Well, the same reason that Mary goes out as soon as something starts blooming and we freshly planted it and she starts blooming, picking the blooms off in the spring, it makes it flourish. I was out in the yard today picking the blooms off of, she taught me this, picking the blooms off of my coleus. The coleus will start blooming everywhere. Pick those blooms off and the coleus will come out like that. And I was out in the front yard going around all my coleus picking the blooms off and they'll get that long and I'm out there pulling them off. And I found out the coleus will keep blooming. That's what the idea is here. It belongs to God. You can't. It's against the law. It's against God's law. You can only eat it after in the fifth year. God said so. But that's for, the, for somebody that's not a Jew. They can still pick it before. No, they can't. It's in the it's in the land of Israel. They do that. They're going to go against the law of God. You're supposed to be keeping people from doing that in the land of Israel. This is the law of God. That's why they're fighting Jesus. In fact, if you remember over here in the book of Luke, the book of Luke. This is not a matter of what we think. This is what God said. And this is the law of Israel. All right. Luke 13 chapter. And Je verse 6. Jesus spake unto this parable. A certain man had a fig tree. Oh, we're still on the same subject, aren't we? Had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Now, Jesus found none, but we've got to know something else about it. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years... I came seeking fruit on this fig tree and found none. Cut it down. Why is it cumbering the ground? Why is it taking up space on the ground and sucking the nutrients out of the ground when it's not bearing fruit? And the man answered and said, Lord, let it alone this year till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit this fourth year, well, if not, after that thou shalt take and cut it down. You had to get rid of a fig tree or a fruit tree that went to the fifth year and it's barren because it's not going to bear fruit ever. And that's why Jesus looks at the Pharisee, or John the Baptist, looks at the Pharisees in the third chapter of Matthew. Third chapter of Matthew. Now, we're going by the law. We're not going by what we think. This was a law in Israel. And 
John the Baptist is confronting the Pharisees. In verse 7, chapter 3 of Matthew, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy, the word is meat, is the word axios, deserving. Bring forth works. If you repent, that's not enough. You have to change your mind and act differently and bring forth fruits. Where's the fruit going to come from? The fruit tree. Isn't it? Question, Jim. Huh? We're supposed to bring forth fruit, fruit also. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith. Galatians 5.22. We bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, don't we? Yes, We're the fruit tree of God. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Every branch in me that abideth in me bringeth forth much fruit in John 15, doesn't it? He, he will cut us down. But he will purge us because we're part of the... We are the branches. We're part of the true vine. The true vine was the root that went down into the... I am the true vine. You're the branches of the vine. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, the Bible says he takes away. But he doesn't mean he's going to cut the branch off and throw it away. Take away actually means to lift up. In the Middle East, when, vine, when it came time for trees or for grapes to ripen, they would take them and lift them up off the ground. They left them on the ground when they were out of season so they wouldn't get hot and burn up. They'd lift them up and put forks in them and they would lift him up in the air so they'd bear fruit. He's going to purge us. If we've got shoots off of us that are not bearing fruit, he's going to cut those. He's going to cut these things in our life off. You may have too many games. You may have too much fun, too many movies, too much bowling, too much of everything. He's going to cut something off until you learn to bear fruit. Now, let's read here. Where was I? Verse All right. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, axios, deserving or suitable for repentance. You don't just say, I repent, I'm home free. No, no, no. That's not repentance. Repentance is a change in your mind and your thinking. We said last Sunday there in Jeremiah 31, 18 and 19, Turn thou me and I shall be turned. And after I was turned, I repented and I was ashamed of myself. You have to have shame you have to have a change. You have to take the blame. Don't say, if you'll take your part of the blame, and I'll take my part. No, no. When you've done wrong, you have to be brokenhearted, and then you have to change and show fruit that is worthy to be called fruits of repentance. You have to change and produce. That's true repentance. Say, I'm going to change my ways and my thinking. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. You're just a tree with the leaves and you're barren, Pharisees and Sadducees. Therefore every fruit which bringeth not, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is shewn down and cast into the fire. Now is Jesus so stupid over there in Mark that he doesn't know how old this tree is. Jesus knew how old every tree in Beth Fadje was. How did he know that? Well, he was God for one thing. I think that's the only thing that matters. He's God, isn't he? So he knew how old the tree was. Back to Mark. And this has to do, this has to do with all these miracles and signs that Jesus is bringing out. It has to do with refuting Pentecostalism. I hate Pentecostalism. I didn't say I hated Pentecostals. I hate Pentecostalism because a lot of people here have been Pentecostals, haven't you? A lot of people we have here used to be Pentecostals. 
I hate Pentecostalism because it has tongues that's not true. It's got faith healing that's not true. The faith healing is a, it's in opposition to all these signs that Jesus brought. They were there to, they were there to prove who Jesus was and who God was. Pentecostals are there for so a man can have all the things he wants, his health and his money and everything else. That's not what those were for. So when I'm teaching on these signs, I'm talking in opposition to what they're saying to these verses. This is, uh, and then he says, the axe has to be laid to the root of the tree, and it has to be cut down. Now let's go back to Mark 11. Mark 11, Jesus curses the fig tree. He says, you see, there is, it's impossible. It's not possible for Jesus to kill that fruit tree unless it was barren. Jesus would have broken the law, wouldn't he? He never broke the law. Never. In fact, it was a law that he had to kill that fig tree if it was barren, not bearing fruit. And he was God staying in front of it and says, it is barren, not bearing fruit, and I'm going to kill it, cast it into the fire. And the Pharisees were fig trees bearing leaves with no fruit. He says, you're going to be cut down and cast into the fire. And then he goes on to say, and then all of a sudden it seems like they went off and Jesus went off in space. Just, but he didn't. The thought continues. The see, if in your Bible, it'll show a little paragraph beginning little sign well whoever put those in there that's not true here the thought continues the thought continues you can blot that out because they came to Jerusalem and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast them out that sold and bought in the temple now this happened in John the second chapter it happened several times now, what he's doing, he's casting out the money changers. Money changers were, they were the Jews who required that if you come to the temple, you have to use Jewish money. And the standard exchange of money in that day and time was Roman money. Roman money, sometimes in the form of Greek coins. So they said that what you had to do, you had to come into the temple and buy a lamb. There was nothing wrong with that. Because everybody had to have a lamb. And some of these guys coming to the temple were shopkeepers. They were not shepherds. Some of them were farmers. They weren't shepherds, and they had to have a lamb to offer on that altar at the temple. So there was nothing wrong with buying a lamb or buying some form of sacrifice for the temple. What Jesus was angry about was these money changers were exchanging the money for Roman money, and they were giving them a bad exchange, maybe 60 cents on the dollar. And he said, you've made my father's house a den of thieves. And he starts throwing the tables. He is infuriated at them because of what they're doing. They're money changers. That was where the sin came in, the money changing, not the buying of a lamb. They'd take that money change, maybe take 60 cents. And don't say Jim said he, they charge exactly 60 cents on the dollar. I'm using that as an illustration. If you go into Canada you have to exchange money for Canadian money. Have many of you been across the border like that? And when you go across the border, you've got to exchange. They give you an exchange of money. Just hope that Canadian money is exchanging high that day. Okay? You have to change for their money when you go over the border and spend their money over there. That's what they were doing here, but they were stealing from the people. So Jesus goes into the temple runs them out, cast them out that bought and sold, and overthrew the table of the money changers. The key is in the word money changers. When you study that, that was a changing of from 
Roman money to Hebrew money. And the seats of them that sold doves, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, it is, not, is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves? And who's running this temple? Pharisees who are trees with leaves and no fruit. That's who they are. And the scribes and the chief priest heard it and sought. Every scribe was a Pharisee. They were the chief Pharisees. They were the doctors of the law. Sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. When, even, when evening came, he went out of the city. So he went into the city to cleanse the literal temple of God, and now he's going to tell Peter and John to cleanse the spiritual temple. That's why he connected this with this. He cleansed the literal temple. He says, now let me come to you, and you're fighting me over killing a fruit tree. And when evening was come, he went out of the city, and in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Jesus had killed it with his words. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Eday, behold, it's a word of shock. Look what you did, Jesus. You killed a fruit tree. Hmm. The fig tree which you cursed is dead dead it's withered away do you not know the law jesus what's wrong with you it was a barren tree you could believe that jesus would not have killed it otherwise you know why jesus walked up to that tree as an illustration to them because he knew their weakness and how weak their faith was and jesus answering saith unto them have faith in god i'm god i know how the tree was Quit arguing with me. <clears throat> For verily I say unto you, and all of a sudden he talks about a mountain? When they spoke of mountains, they spoke of capital cities. If you say to this mountain, what mountain is he talking about? Self. Self. Babylon mothered all idolatry. Babylon was founded on self. Let us make us a name. Let us make us a name. Name is the word shem. It means authority. They made up their own authority. And let us make us a name as a Babylonian system. And over in Jeremiah, the 50th and 51st chapter, Here's what God says about Babylon. You say, Jim, what does this have to do with all these signs? The signs are miracles to verify who God is, not a Pentecostal miracle so somebody can have money and have good health and go out and live like the devil. It has nothing to do with these Pentecostals. Pentecostals will watch me and say, oh, I don't like that guy. Well, that's fine. I don't really care. You're involved in something that's evil and that's wicked. Now, he's talking about the destruction of Babylon. And he says here in the 50th chapter, or 51, excuse me, 50th chapter, excuse me, chapter 50. 50 and 51 is about the destruction of Babylon in the Old Testament. Chapter 50 and 51 go along with chapter 13 and 14 of Isaiah because that's about the destruction of Babylon by the Persian king Cyrus. And these go along with some other chapters. It goes along with the fifth chapter of Daniel where Belshazzar is the last king of Babylon. And he sees the handwriting on the wall. These are all synonymous chapters. They happen at the same time. And he says here in chapter 50, talking about Babylon's destruction, verse 29, Call together the archers against Babylon, all ye that bend the bow, 
Camp against Babylon. Camp against this, let us make us a name. Let none escape. Recompense her according to her work, according to all that she hath done. Do unto her, for she hath been proud against the Lord, against the Holy One of Israel. Therefore shall her young men fall in the streets, and all her men of war shall be cut off in that day. Behold, I am against thee, O thou most proud Babylon. Let us make us a name system, saith the Lord God of hosts. For thy day is come, the time that I will visit thee. And he talks about destroying Babylon. And he says through here, he says, Babylon, look over here in verse 24 of chapter 51. I will render unto Babylon to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion. In your sight, saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain of Babylon. If you'll say to this mountain, Be thou removed. What is the mountain that Peter and John were involved in? Correcting Jesus because they had made themselves a name and come up with their own doctrine, their own authority. If you'll say to the mountain of Babylon when you're arguing with God, have faith in God, I'm God, I know how the tree is. That's Pentecostalism. It says, say to the mountain of debt, say to the mountain of money, come to me, say to the mountain of health, be removed. This is talking about believing God as opposed to believing self. And this is what they call positive confession. And they've taken this verse here and some other verses and wrenched it and twisted it and made it this godless Pentecostalism. Pentecost is 50 days after the Passover, but it has nothing to do with this Pentecostalism, this saying to a mountain of debt, saying to a... Uh, speaking it with your mouth and getting it because you've got positive vibrations. They say they can perform miracles and heal people just by saying it. That ignorant Kenneth Hagin said one time, I heard him say on TV, why, I knew this man is going to be saved because I stood outside that city on a mountaintop and I looked down over that city and I claimed that man with my mouth, with the words of my mouth, I claimed that man. Why didn't you claim everybody in the city? Why don't you just claim everybody in the state? Why don't you claim everybody in the world? Why don't you claim the Martians and the people on Venus? And claim the devil? It's just ignorant. Now, I'm against the old destroying mountain, saith the Lord, which destroys all the earth. How does it destroy the earth? It's the mother of all idolatry on self. Let us make us up our own doctrine, our own name. That's how I'm preaching on these signs because I have a resentment against Pentecostalism. I hate it. If you're watching, you're Pentecostal. You're in the devil's doctrine. That distributes fortunes, doesn't it? Healing somebody because you want them to be healed and performing that kind of a miracle, which Jesus only did that for the sake of the believers that were watching. That was the sign was to the eye of the man watching. God transgressing the law of nature by healing a man of a disease that he's supposed to die from. But he was a believer when he healed him. I will stretch out mine hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks and I will make thee a burnt mountain. And he goes all through here talking about Babylon. In verse 33 the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. It is time to thresh her. That's exactly what John says after he says, lay the axe to the root of the tree. In Matthew 3, he says, he says you've got to thresh, the, you have to take these people to the threshing floor. A threshing floor was a, a place where you threw the wheat up into the air and it was a, a concave little well type thing and they'd throw it in the air and the wind would blow away the chaff and he speaks of this being a threshing floor and he says the same thing here in in uh, the 51st chapter of Jeremiah the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor it is time to thresh her 
yet a little while and the time of her harvest shall come. So he says, I want to make you a burnt mountain. Well, in the eighth chapter of Revelation, you find these angels sounding. Look here in Revelation, the eighth chapter. Revelation 8. And this is the same mountain he's talking to Peter and John about. It's a mountain of self inside of self. A mountain was a ruling city, a capital city of an empire that executed a law. This is all very, this is why men can't see the scriptures. They don't think abstract. And you look at the 8th chapter of Revelation and you see seven angels with seven trumpets. And he says in verse... Eight, the first trumpet sounds in verse 7. The second trumpet sounds in verse 8. The second angel sounded as it were a great mountain burning with fire. That would be the destruction of Babylon, wouldn't it? Then you, you get over here to the, <clears throat> to the, 20, to the uh, 20th, excuse me, 18th chapter, 18th chapter of Revelation. And I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was light. Earth was, the earth was lightened with his glory and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, voice saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It fell one time in the Old Testament as an international city. At the end of time it will fall and it will become a burnt mountain. That's what this chapter says. So if you say to this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, everywhere you find Babylon coming down, it always sinks into the sea. It sinks into the Euphrates in the 51st chapter of Jeremiah. And he says here, Babylon's going to fall again. And he talks about it and says, Babylon has lived deliciously in verse 7. That word means in a strange, strainos, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no more a widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. There's the burnt mountain. Sing to this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication. She's... She has polluted all the kings of the earth with let us make us a name. That's what's going on in all the churches in America, isn't it? The Baptists have made themselves an authority, a doctrine, a name. The Pentecostals have. Faith healing is just let us make us a name. It's not true. And with her shall be well her and lament her when they shall see the smoke of this burning mountain. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come, O destroying mountain. And then it goes into all the goodies of the first century that's going to be destroyed. And down in verse, verse 17, For in one hour so great riches has come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and all the goodies of this world and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of this burning mountain saying what city is like unto this great city it's an international city of self and we're living in it and Peter and John got caught up in it and so did most of us somewhere in our life when we start arguing with God don't we And he destroys Babylon. And look at verse, we'll read verse 20 and 21. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets. For God hath avenged you and her, and a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea. If you'll say to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. And the swine, which were a picture of self, ran down into the sea, didn't they? Saying, thus with violence shall that great city Babylon, the destroying mountain that Peter and John, when you get involved in arguing with God about your life, you know what that's about. 
getting upset in your mind at people and stressing out and not believing God has predestined everything and preordained everything the way it is. You get involved in your own name when you stress out and you end up with bad health because you've... I have ended up... I ended up with real bad health in my 40s because I was stressing out so... And I wasn't believing God. I've gotten to where I believe Him about everything now. I believe Him about what he, what happens of people getting mad and leaving and cussing me. I, I've said this the other day. I'm reading a book. I picked up a book two doors down at a garage sale. It was... It's called The Death of a President. I really like biographies, and it's about the assassination of John Kennedy. And uh, the writer is William Manchester, and he was commissioned by Jackie Kennedy to write it. And he says that all pre he, presidents are in such a position, everybody's shooting at them. Now, even though they may not be as good as what you think they're supposed to be, it's a place of tremendous responsibility. And everybody's trying to shoot every one of them down. You probably wouldn't be so angry at any of them if you knew what they had to do and what they had to face. If you notice, all of them start become president when they got dark hair and their hair gets gray all the time they're in office. And this William Manchester said that presidents are in such a position that everybody's shooting at them. And they had, they had uh, complaining names for everybody, from Abe Lincoln back to George Washington. And during the lifetime of all these people, they were shooting at them constantly and all these bad things to say about them. Anytime you're in a place of position, and that's where I am, I'm having all these people shoot at me and say all manner of evil against me falsely. And I've learned just to accept that. I'm just going to accept. You can say what you want to say. But believe me, you can't stop this ministry if God wants it to keep going. You're going to have no more effect than if you went outside and poured a glass of water on the ground because I'm not quitting. God put this here, and we're going to stay. You can make yourself a name if you want to. And you're no more affecting what we're doing than some little kid out here in the parking lot saying, I'm going to stop grace and truth, and I'm five years old. Okay, go ahead. That's all I got to say to you. Do your best. Do your dirty deeds. Now, let's go back over here. And the reason I'm bringing this out, may I remind you, we're talking about signs. All these people don't even know the signs. These Pentecostals, Charismatics, even a lot of Baptists who believe in faith healing. There's no such thing as faith healing. If there was... Men would never get so old they couldn't be healed. When you get old, everybody dies of natural causes, dies of a disease. Everybody. Therefore, we should have men walking around on the earth that are 2,000 years old and say, well, I've had faith every time I got real sick. When you get to be 85 or 90 and you start getting heart disease and you start getting pulmonary disease and you end up in the hospital with uh, fluid around the heart, well... Just say, I believe my way out of it. I'm going to say positive words and positive confession, and I'm going to be well. No, you're not. You're going to die. Isn't that funny? Kenneth Hagin died, and, Kenneth, and, and uh, Oral Roberts died. Why didn't they speak some positive words and not die? And they say if they speak positive words, they can get what these signs are in the Bible. The signs will prove who Jesus was. They wasn't for the, for the purpose of healing the man. Not what they were for. That guy just happened to be fortunate enough to be a believer. And Jesus said, I'm going to pick you out. You remember in, in the seventh chapter of John? Was it seventh chapter? I'm getting a little... I'm losing my place here. I'll tell you where it is. And I'm talking about... Yeah. Uh, no, not the seventh chapter, the fifth chapter. In the fifth chapter of John, there's a... 
multitude of impotent folk around this pool of Bethesda. And Jesus walks through this crowd laying out here. They had a superstition that the water moved, the first one into the water would be healed. And Jesus walks through all these people and says, Excuse me, sir, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And he walks up to this man. One man says, Wilt thou be made whole? If he wants everybody healed, why didn't he say, Would everybody like to hear to like to be healed? No, he just went over to a believer and said, Will you be made whole? And he said, Lord, I don't have anyone to take me into the water. He said, You stand up and walk. And he proved who he was there by healing one man, not everybody there. If he wanted everybody to be healed, he would have healed everybody, wouldn't he? Does Jesus heal? Well, certainly he does. Does he heal on your command? No, he does not. He heals who he wants to. Now, go back over here to Mark 11. Now you can see what he's saying. They're arguing with Jesus for killing a fig tree. And they're saying this is positive confession. See, I can say with my mouth, positive confession, I can get what I want. That's not what this is saying. If you'll say to this mountain of self, of this let us make us a name, you'll argue with me, I know how the fruit tree was. If you'll say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, Babylon is always cast into the sea, isn't it? In fact, in Jeremiah, the 21st chapter, if you want to look at uh, 51st chapter, if you want to look at it, this is the destruction of Babylon. This is Jeremiah's account of the destruction of Old Testament Babylon. And he says here in the 51st chapter, he tells the prophet, take this book of the law. He wrote in the book all the evil that should come upon Babylon, verse 60. Given these words that are written against Babylon, and Jeremiah said unto Sarahia, When thou comest to Babylon, prophet of God, Sarahia, here's one of those guys that's a prophet that he's not well known, but he is a prophet, and we'll see him in heaven. And shall see and shall read these words, then shalt thou say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place, Babylon, to cut it off, that none shall remain of it, neither man nor beast, but that it shall be desolate forever. He says that in this 51st chapter a couple of times. It'll never be inhabited again. He says that in the 13th chapter of Isaiah. When I bring it down, it'll never be inhabited. When Saddam Hussein he was, said he's going to rebuild Babylon on the Euphrates River and he's going to, and he's going to be the new Nebuchadnezzar, he was a crazy man because the Bible says it would never happen. And it didn't. He got killed, didn't he? And it shall be when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt, shalt bind a stone to it. Now we're fixing to perform a contract. Bind a stone to it and cast it into the midst of the Euphrates. Babylon straddled the Euphrates. It was on both sides of the Euphrates with a seven-tier bridge that crossed the Euphrates. And thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her. They shall be weary thus far are the words of Jeremiah. Babylon is going to sink into the waters. If you'll say to this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in your heart. Doubt diacrino means to decide. Stop deciding what's right and wrong. They were diacrino. Diacrino means to discriminate. They were saying, Jesus, we know you're God. But, and you are usually right, but we're right today because you killed a fig tree. Crino means to judge. Dia means to become the channel of judging. And they had become the channel of judging, made themselves a name, and he said, you need to remove this mountain of Babylon. You need to say, self be removed and be cast into the sea. And shall not doubt. The best definition of the word doubt. Do I have any time, Mike? The best definition of the word doubt is over in Romans, the fourth chapter. This is the same word, diacrino. I've preached on this a bunch of times, but this goes along. 
This goes along with these signs and miracles that I'm bringing out. Most people think these miracles are just for the sake of somebody being healed, and they weren't. They were, the, they were pointers to point at God as to who was doing this. Everybody, if God wanted to heal everybody, he could have, couldn't he? Could have, but he didn't. Then he says here in Romans 4, here's the best definition for doubt. And this is another place where these charismatics say, see, you get what you say. By calling it, calling things that not to be as though they were. And they're saying this is how they perform miracles. The reason I'm bringing this out about signs, I keep saying, is because they were for the sake of the viewer, not for the sake of the one being healed. It was to prove to the believers who God was. And in verse 17, it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him, whom he believed, even God who quickens the dead. God who Z-O-O-P-O-I-E-O -O -O makes alive the dead. And then he says, and calleth those things that be not. Now they'll say, the Pentecostals and Charismatics say, here's positive confession. You say these positive vibrations with your mouth. That's a lie. Calling things that be not. Something that was not was something that was dead. In the second chapter of Matthew, Herod sends out a decree to kill all the children from two years old and under. And then concerning this, speaking of Israel, the Bible says, and Re Rachel was weeping for her children... Because they were not. All these babies were dead in Israel. And then whenever Jacob's sons, ten sons, went over into Egypt to talk to this prince, who was actually Joseph, but they didn't know it, they came back and told their father, we went to talk to that prince, and he asked us, who, do you have only ten of you? And they told him, we got eleven brothers and one is not. Speaking of Jacob. And then Jacob turns around and tells his son, his 11 sons, why did you tell this man, this prince, that you had 12 brothers all together and one is not? Jacob and Joseph is not. What he was saying is Joseph is dead. So calling things that be not is calling something from the dead and making it alive. That's what it is. And that's what he's saying here. Who against hope, and they use this verse, calling things that be not as though they were. All you have to do is say, Cadillac, I get a Cadillac, I get a Cadillac, and you get one. That's charismatic, stupid, foolish, Pentecostal doctrine. Who against hope, believed in hope. This is talking about Abraham. It says, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, speaking to Abraham out of verse 16. The favor of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Abraham, who against hope, believed in hope. God says, you're going to have a son, and you've got dead loins. You don't have any sperm in your loins. You're white. You are 99 years old. Sarah is 89. When... Isaac is born, you're going to be 100 and she's going to be 90 and you, she don't ovulate and she can't have kids, but you're going to have a son. That's what calling things that be not. Isaac is going to be called from the dead loins of his father and the dead womb of his mother because it says so in the next verses here. And Abraham, against hope, believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. They didn't have any children. They had one, but God didn't count him, and his name was Ishmael because Sarah sent Abraham into, into Hagar, his hand, her handmaiden, Egyptian handmaiden, says, have a child by her. But when Ishmael was born, when God tells Abraham in the 22nd chapter of Genesis, take thy son, thine only son Isaac, and kill him. He didn't even recognize Ishmael who was 13 years younger. Didn't even call him a son of Abraham. Said, Isaac is your son, your only son. Offer him. 
He become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. Isaac will be the father of all the nations of the world. And in his Isaac will thy seed be called. Because Isaac was resurrected from the dead. In resurrection will the seed of God be called. And we are the children of Isaac spiritually because we are resurrected daily. And Abraham, being not weak in faith, considered not his own body now dead. His body was dead. He didn't have any seed, no sperm. And when he was about 100 years old, he was 100 years old when he had Isaac. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. And he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Unbelief is staggering, isn't it? In this sentence here, wouldn't you call staggering unbelief? Stagger is the word diacrino. Stagger, diacrino, means unbelief, doesn't it? So let's apply unbelief over there to Mark the 11th chapter. Can you see that? Staggering is unbelief, isn't it? That's, the, that's where this word study concordant comes in because when you look up Diacrino, every time it's mentioned, you hit this verse right here. It's just stagger is unbelief. So doubt and stagger are equivalent, meaning unbelief. That's right. Doubt and unbelief are equivalent. Doubt equals unbelief. So let's just read that that way over here in Mark 11. If you'll say to this mountain, Babylon, self, this let us make us the name system, you're arguing with me about killing a fruit tree, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, the way Babylon is always destroyed, and shall not, through unbelief, doubt in his heart. Not have unbelief in your heart. You'll start believing me instead of believing yourself. Unbelief is believing self and not believing God, isn't it? But shall believe that those things which he saith, this is the word that they say means positive confession. Say it. If you'll believe that those things that you say shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Saith is the word eklegomai, E-K-L-E-G-O-M-A-I. Eklego. From the beginning, God has leg. Excuse me, it's the word, I've got that. It's the word lego. And lego is the verb form of logos, which is the word of God, and you have to speak the word of God. You have to confess Christ to have what you say. Homologeo means to be of the same word as God. You have to homologos of the same word or agree with God. You can't make up your own doctrine. That's the whole idea. Say to this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea. Quit saying your word. Say, God, I'm going to agree with you. Then you're going to have whatsoever you say. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire. That word desire doesn't mean to lust after. It's the word I tell oh. Same word as I ask. First John three twenty two. We receive the things that we desire, or that we ask, if we keep His commandments, and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. And what is pleasing is giving our bodies a living sacrifice. It's the same basic word, aresco. And aresco, over there in Romans twelve and one. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice on a daily cross by telling the truth all the time. And that's when you receive what you say. You have to say the word of God and you get crucified for it. You see, but, see, they take this word saith and say, see, as positive confession, you can heal people that way. You can say, be healed, Satan, get out. Charismatic doctrine is one of the biggest lies that has ever been spun in the world. I hate charismatic doctrine. I hate the charism. I despise this positive confession stuff. It's not true. They say they bring about what Jesus calls signs 
by positive confession. And that is paganism out of the Far East. It's what it is. Do I have any time? Two minutes. They say all they have to do is say with their mouth and they get what they say. This is in exact opposition to what the signs were for. All the miracles were signs. They were signs to us as believers. And they're spiritual signs to us, whereas they were literal signs to Israel over here. To show who God is. The Jews seek a sign. That's what 1 Corinthians, the first chapter says. They seek a sign. The Greeks seek wisdom. That's why the Pharisees would come to Jesus and say, give us a sign from heaven. He said, you're not going to get any sign from now on except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And that is what, and that was resurrection. The only, when the signs of an apostle were canceled out, when the church matured and grew up, and when agape comes in the church and the church matures, then these gifts of an apostle will be done away with. We talked about this in, Matthew, in Mark, the 16th chapter. The apostles had signs, but it's not this positive confession. I was talking to a guy in a bookstore yesterday. He said, well, I don't know what Max Lucado says. Max Lucado holds hands with all these guys. Max Lucado is a church of Christ. Church of Christ, believe you have to be dipped in water by a church of Christ preacher or you can't go to heaven when you die. You can be dipped in water by a Baptist preacher and you still go to hell. And you've got to eat crackers and grape juice every Sunday and call it communion or you're going to go to hell. But you have to eat that in a church of Christ church. Max Lucado was a church of Christ. He is holding hands and he is a false teacher. And I tried to tell this guy that on this bookstore and he just said, well, I don't know what he says. I just go home and look it up on the internet. Look up Max Lucado, false teacher. You got all, they're all holding hands. All the charismatics, Lucado and all the rest of them, they're in one big mush pile of being positive, thinking positive, thinking good, thinking right, say it with your mouth and you get it. It's not true. Jesus said the poor will always be with us. And everybody's going to die of a disease that don't die of some unnatural causes. If you die of natural causes, you're going to die of a disease. I will die of a disease one day, probably be with my pulmonary disease, pulmonary system, or a heart attack. And I don't, why would you, if you're going to die and go be with the Lord, why would you want to be healed to live here? This is an insane world. Huh? If I was going to, God says, I've got it set for you to die next week at 3 o'clock. I'd say, okay, Lord, let me help prepare some stuff. I'll be anxious to come see you. I wouldn't be saying, somebody heal me. Get me all, keep me from dying. Let me stay in this miserable world and fight people. Ask Mike Lida to come over and lay hands on me. Yeah, I'll ask Mike to come lay hands on me. He's liable to impart some mathematical thing into my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or or inject some computer program in there. I'm out of time. I hope you can see why I'm bringing out this positive confession stuff along with the, the signs is because all these Pentecostals and Charismatic have interpreted all these miracles as something for them and it's something they can do as opposed to God saying the signs are to point to me. They're not to point to them. They've got them pointing to them, don't they? Trying to take credit. Trying to, trying to take credit. We can do that. We can say it with our mouth and get it. And that points at me. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, what a tremendous God you are to let us see these things. We pray that you'll cause us to continue work, Lord, and crush us under your hand. Cause us to bow to your will. Lead us to your elect. I pray for the church, that you'll mature the church. They, so many of them need help, Lord. Especially these needy people. Help us with them. Lead us to your family, your elect family. Open up many doors for the ministry. I'll keep saying these things, Lord. 
We'll give you praise for all things in Christ's name. Amen. This, this thing on signs is a part of the charismatic misconstruing of the Word of God. Part of it. And you said before, a phlegomai is the movement of the Legos. Right? Yeah, it's, a, it's the movement of the Legos. If you're going to agree with God, you've got to say His Word. You can't just have your way. It's turning around and saying,